Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. My name is Ann Barnhart. Um, I'm not going to go through a whole lot of biographical information. In fact, I'm not going to do a whole lot of bio at all. If you or anyone out there on the internet is interested in learning about me, all you have to do is Google my name, A-N-N-B-A-R-N-H-A-R-D-T, and you can enjoy hours and hours of reading and uh, video watching fun. I'm not going to waste time with, with biographical information because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Furthermore, it really doesn't matter who I am. Um, all I'm doing is I am relaying to you objective reality, objective truth. Who I am really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. If you all want to think of me as nothing more than the weather girl, then that's fine by me. I'm just communicating this information to you. All right, let's get started. The title of this presentation is The Economy is Going to Implode and You Deserve to Understand Why. Um, most people out there have absolutely no idea of what is going on in the financial markets, in the economy, and they especially do not understand the scope of what's going on in the financial sector and in the economy and the fact that we have now passed critical mass and it can no longer be saved. What I want to get out in front of people is the very basic nitty gritty in layman's terms of what's going on so that the average American out there can understand the true gravity of the situation. And I'm also going to impart a few suggestions for what can be done to fix the situation after the collapse, after the war, and in the rebuilding phase. Because if you're watching this, chances are you are going to be in that class of people who is going to be morally tasked with rebuilding this nation and this civilization. There's some things you need to know. You need to understand how this system is broken, and you also need to understand what you're going to need to do to fix it and get it back on the right track when you come out the other side of this. Um, for those of you out there on the internet watching, a lot of you will be saying, well, you didn't go into enough detail about this. You weren't technical enough about that. Guys, you got to understand what my objective here is. My objective here is not to dive into the absolute minutia of the MF global collapse. These people don't even understand what repos are. These people don't understand what CDS is. They don't understand any of these things. I just need to get a very basic primer in front of them so that they can understand these things. Um, also, do not email me and say, um, why didn't you talk about this? Why didn't you talk about that? Why didn't you talk about the other? In order to get just the very basics covered, we're looking at two, two and a half hours I'm estimating here, okay? Most people in this country have about a 30 second attention span. So you can see the wall that I'm up against here. Um, if you think that there's a topic that I didn't cover that needs to be covered, God bless you. Make your own YouTube. Put it up on the internet so that everybody can see it. But I'm just gonna cover what I think is the very basics in this presentation, and hopefully we'll get it under 2.30. Question, how much of your wealth is allocated as zeros and ones on computer servers? How much is physical in your possession and defensible? For most people, the bulk of their wealth is completely indefensible. The bulk of their wealth they have really no true custody of and it could be confiscated instantaneously. What I've been saying to people for months and months and months and going on years now is, is that if you can't stand in front of it with an assault rifle and physically defend it, it's not really yours. Anything sitting in any sort of an account doesn't actually exist. It is, doesn't exist physically. It is zeros and ones on a computer server. And you have to trust the people behind the computer servers, A, not to confiscate it, and B, to allow you to have access to it, and that it is going to have zero counterparty risk when you get it back. These are all questions that are monumentally huge. MF Global, 1.6 billion in segregated, sacrosanct customer funds, confiscated, stolen, like that, by John Corzine and his cronies at MF Global. Um, PFG Best, 
another Ponzi scheme, 225 million in customer funds, never actually existed. The whole thing was a Ponzi scheme. Me personally, I can testify to this. This is being recorded on November 2nd, 2012. A week ago today, I have declared a federal tax strike. A week ago today, the IRS levied my personal bank account. Bye-bye money gone it will and I'll never see it again okay so if this money is sitting in these accounts and it's just zeros and ones on a computer server you have to understand the massive massive risk and and people in this culture we're so used to the rule of law we're so used to the sacrosanct nature of our accounts that we cannot even fathom the possibility that our money could just be confiscated and taken away. You have to understand the risk that you are, that you are standing right now, every one of you. It doesn't matter how honest your brokers, wealth managers, or local bankers are. The problem is systemic and it will touch every person on earth. I hear this all the time. I have people call me all the time and say, well, I'm all right because my broker is a great guy. I'm sure your broker is a great guy. I'm sure your banker is a great guy and wouldn't dream of stealing your money out of your account. That's not the counterparty. That's not the danger. That's not who we're talking about. We are talking about what is called the federal government. We are talking about the entire global financial system. It doesn't matter how honest your brokers are. This is why I shut down my commodity brokerage. Because I knew after MF Global that I could do nothing nothing to defend my clients and their assets that were sitting in my commodity brokerage. It doesn't matter how awesome and how honest I may be. There was nothing I could do to protect my clients. If my FCM went under the same way that MF Global went under, and my FCM did eventually go under about seven months later, not in the same fashion, but it went under. I could not protect my clients. I didn't have the wealth myself to backstop my clients' accounts. If their money got corzined, so to speak, the way the MF Global customers got corzined, I could not have done anything to help them. And I could not live with that. You can steal all of my money. You can take everything I own. You can put me in the gutter to where I'm living in a refrigerator box under the bridge. That's fine, but you're not going to take my client's money. So I had to shut my firm down and I had to get them out. That was the only moral option for me. You have to understand this. It doesn't have anything to do with how, how honest and good your local guys are because this isn't a local problem. This is big. This is as big as it gets. What is money? First of all, um, as you're watching and going through, um, we have the workbook available. You should have been able to download the workbook off of the link underneath the YouTube clip in the information section. So you've got your workbook hopefully at home if you want. The fellas here in the room, they all have their workbook. The way it works is, is on the slide, this turquoise number here is the page that I'm on in the workbook. The first three pages of the workbook was just very simply uh, the going galt letter that I wrote in November of 2011 when I shut down my brokerage firm. That's just provided for you. That's the only biographical information I'll provide. You can see pretty much how I feel and what happened to me by reading that letter. Now we are into the workbook and we're on page five. The question is, what is money? Money is a fungible proxy for man's ability to reason, labor, create, and produce. People do not understand what money is. Money is, in a sense, it gets into, into in a sense, the spiritual and the metaphysical. Because like I said, it is a fungible proxy for man's ability to reason, labor, create, and produce. It is, in essence, your, your humanity turned into this fungible proxy that we use for exchange. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, what does fungible proxy mean? Well, first of all, proxy. Proxy means uh, a representative agent, a substitution, OK? What does fungible mean? Fungible means um, that it is completely interchangeable. 
I could get into my wallet and I could pull out a hundred dollar bill and I could exchange my hundred dollar bill with the hundred dollar bill of the gentleman that's sitting right here in front of me. Those two hundred dollar bills, even though they're physically different pieces of paper, they are for all intents and purposes, exactly the same thing. They represent the same thing. That is fungibility. Why do we have the need for a fungible currency? And this is universal throughout human history. Why must there be this, this fungible proxy? Because for example, my business, okay, I was in the cattle business. My skill set was teaching cattlemen how to trade cash cattle. That's my skill set. What, what use does that skill set have to this gentleman who's sitting right here in front of me who has nothing to do with the cattle industry? I can't trade or barter with him in terms of my personal skill set. Now, let's, let's say, for example, that the gentleman sitting in front of me, and I'm just making this up, let's say that he is in the, uh, let's say he's in the steel manufacturing business. Well, he can neither pay me in steel because I, as I stand here, have no real use or application for steel. I, I can't do anything with that. If we even get more specific back to my, my old vocation in agriculture, I'm, what if I had a, a guy come to one of my cattle marketing classes who also did some farming? Let's say he was a wheat farmer. Could he pay me in bushels, physical bushels of wheat? Again, you can say, well, Anne, you could, use, you could use wheat. Sure, but I don't have any ability to process the wheat. I can't mill it. I can't turn it into flour. And even then, do I need, how, how many pounds of flour do I need, really? How many can I personally consume? So you can see why humanity, from the very earliest days, went to this system where we have to have this fungible proxy, this currency that we can exchange with each other that is a proxy for our, our labor, our, pro our productivity, our creativity, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can all have an extremely efficient means of doing business and having economic activity with each other without having to find the person who deals in exactly the commodity that I need right this second, and then can I even process it or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's what money is. At the end of the day, it is a proxy for your humanity. Your humanity, your ability to work. Don't forget that because that's so important. What is fungibility? We've already gone through that. It's the ability to mutually substitute individual units. Okay, humanity started using precious metals as that fungible proxy. They looked at gold and silver and they said, hmm, look at this, this interesting, beautiful yellow metal that we can dig out of the ground. Um, it's very pretty, it's, uh, it's rare, and it doesn't rust, it doesn't erode or corrode. So let's do this, let's dig this metal out of the ground Let's turn it into coins, and then those coins will be what we use to substitute for our ability to work and labor. Ah, good idea. Okay, and then humanity evolved into paper currencies, and we'll talk about paper currencies a little more in a bit. As I said, my ability to teach people how to trade cash cattle is not is not terribly fungible. It's very specific. Therefore, I am paid in fiat currency. I am paid in, right now, US dollars. All currency, ladies and gentlemen, is fiat, including gold. Gold is fiat currency. All currency is fiat currency because all currency is a fungible proxy for your ability as a human to labor and produce. What does the word fiat mean in Latin? It means let it be. And that's exactly what they did millennia ago with, with gold. They looked at it and they said, let that be the substitution for my ability to produce. And everybody agreed to this. Let gold be money. Let US dollars be money. Let zeros and ones on a computer server be money. Let Tide detergent be money. Do you guys know that this is going on? Do you know that in the inner cities already that the big bottles of Tide uh, uh, laundry detergent is being used in the inner cities as a currency? 
and it's equivalent to roughly 20 bucks. If you go to the store and look and you'll buy one of the big ones, it's about 20 bucks, they will go into stores and they will shoplift out cartloads, cartloads of Tide detergent, and then it, it is being used on the street in the inner cities as a currency. Isn't that interesting? So really, anything, it, whenever humanity says, let that be money, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a fiat currency. Therefore, all currencies, including gold, are fiat currencies. Time literally is money because money is the proxy for human capacity and productivity. Time is money. Don't forget this. We're going to come back to this when we're talking about interest in a few minutes, okay? It is the substitution, and we even quoted in that. How much are you paid per hour? How many dollars per hour is your wage? Because you have to pass through time in order to be productive, in order to do anything. Okay, just nailing all these concepts down because they're so important and it seems to me nobody understands any of this anymore, including the people running the Federal Reserve. Not that they aren't criminals in the first place, but you know the point I'm making. All right, so let's, let's walk through this thought about time being money. Now we're on page six in your workbook. The U.S. GDP is approximately how much? Do you know? Do you know what GDP is? It's about 15 and a half trillion. Fill that in in your workbook. 15 and a half trillion, and I use triple T for my abbreviation for trillion, so you know. Average wage, let's call the average wage in the, in the United States, not in China, in the United States, let's call that $20 an hour, okay? 20 bucks an hour. The average work year, standard work year is 2,000 hours, okay? Now let's do some math off of this. Fifteen and a half trillion, lots of zeros there kids, make sure you get all those zeros in there, divided by twenty dollars per hour means that the GDP is actually, that's a big number, can you read what it is? It's seven hundred and seventy-five billion man hours per year if we use 20 bucks an hour as an average wage, okay? I want you all to start thinking about the size of this economy, not in terms of dollars, because it seems to me that, that these numbers in terms of dollars don't even mean anything to anyone anymore. Someone says a trillion and people just shrug their shoulders. You know, trillion, billion, quadrillion. We're going to start, pretty soon, we're going to start talking about quadrillions, okay? And it just doesn't have any meaning. Let's turn this into man hours and see if we can't recapture that sense of meaning, okay? So we're looking at the United States gross domestic product is basically 775 billion man hours. 775 billion total man hours divided by 2,000 hours per work year means that the U.S. GDP is something like 387,500,000 total man years. That's the U.S. GDP in just one year. Okay, thinking about this in terms of time puts a completely different perspective on it, doesn't it? 387 million man years, okay? Since money is a proxy, the true underlying unit of GDP is man hours or man years. Don't forget this, we're gonna circle right back around to this at the very end. The true units of GDP, don't talk to me anymore in terms of dollars because the, the unit of the dollar itself is, be, is becoming increasingly more and more meaningless in a sense. Think about this and talk to me in terms of how many man hours are we talking about here? And then think about the levels of debt in terms of man hours, because ladies and gentlemen, that is how it will be paid. It will either be paid in man hours, land acquisition, or blood. Remember this for later. Currency solution. On page six, jot this down. Here's a solution for you. 
after the collapse, after the war, when you all come out the other side, you're going to have to understand this. The gold standard is not necessary. And here's where all the Ron Paul people's heads are going to explode. I don't care. You need to understand this. I don't care. You need to understand this. The gold standard is not necessary. Gold can be corrupted just as much as paper currency. Hello, anybody seen on the internet that, um, yeah, a lot of the gold turns out to have tungsten cores inside of it? They're finding bullion in New York City, bullion with tungsten cores, with just a gold, uh, not leaf, but just a gold veneer on the outside. You, you all stacking this gold, you're going to have to get a drill out or get some sort of a device to see. Uh, there, there are sonic resonance devices, I believe, that can assay uh, a piece of gold bullion. But um, yeah, gold can be corrupted just as much as anything else. Think about Rome. What did Rome do to its metal coinage? It debased and debased and debased and debased. And it did it with the silver. It did exactly what we did with our, with our coinage. It started out being almost 100% silver. And by the time the Roman Empire collapsed, the, the coinage was basically 0% silver. There was so little silver in it that it was just trivial. You can debase you can debase metals just like you can debase a paper currency. So get off of this notion that you're, oh, we have to go to the gold standard. It could help in the beginning as a step back towards integrity, but don't get fixated on it and think that that is the complete and total solution to all of the problems. It isn't. The other thing to remember about going to a gold standard is imagine if we did that. Imagine if Obama did it tomorrow. What would they do? They would lie and they would say we have X number of tons of gold at the Federal Reserve or under the World Trade Center or in Fort Knox. And it would be a complete lie. There would be no way for you or anyone else to audit that. You, you really think the government would let anybody audit the gold inventory? You're out of your mind. And then what would the Obama regime do or any other regime? What would they do? They would start issuing gold certificates to their friends ad infinitum, ad nauseum. Oh, sure, you, you want a gold certificate? Sure, I'll give you a gold certificate for a thousand ounces. Here you go. And there's nothing backing it up, and there's no way to audit, and there's no way to reconcile any of it. Going to the gold standard is not going to solve this, okay? The solution, here it comes. This is probably the hardest concept in the entire presentation. The solution is a moral society. The currency problem is a problem with men's hearts, and that is the only place that it can be fixed. Oh, I don't want to hear about all that religious crap. Well, by golly, you're going to have to. You're going to have to. If you have a nation of complete moral degenerates and total lawlessness, do you honestly think that there is anything that can be done economically to fix that? No. The, 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 the problem is right here. It's right here. And it's with all of these people out here. You have to fix that first. We are the gold. What, remember, what did we just get through saying? What is money? It is a fungible proxy for human capacity. We are the gold. We are the money. We are the economy, and if we're all a bunch of brain-dead, moral, degenerate sociopaths and psychopaths, there is nothing that anyone can do to fix that economy. The core foundational premise is men's hearts. And I don't care if you don't want to be hearing about that. You've got to hear about it. Deal with this reality. Deal with it now. The sooner you deal with it, the easier it'll be to come out the other side. If, if you want to fight an entire massive global war where hundreds of millions, if not billions of people die in order to learn this lesson, then by God, that's what's going to happen. But you could nip that in the bud, come to this reality now, and, and assuage all of that. The choice is yours. And frankly, I'm not too terribly optimistic about the whole thing, but I'm, I'm kind of a realist. 
Interest on money is therefore utterly essential from both a moral and an economic perspective. Zero percent interest, which is what we have right now and what the criminals in Washington, D.C. have put into place, says that a man's capacity to reason, labor, create, and produce has no time value. Money is the proxy for your ability to be a human and to create and produce. So all the money that you have, you have earned through your human activities to create and produce. Now you've got, let's say, $100,000 in your hand and you want to loan it to somebody else. You loan it to somebody else. You let them use that money, which is a proxy for your very existence for a year. And when it comes time a year from now for them to pay you back, what do they pay you back in a zero interest rate environment? They pay you back just the initial principal with no payment or compensation to you whatsoever for the time, for the productivity that could have been generated over that year to you through the use of that money, which again, the source of that money is your own humanity itself. Th this is insane. This is morally wrong. When you hear anybody talking about eliminating usury, eliminating interest, completely reforming the banking system so that there's no interest, these people are insane, they're evil, and what 99.9% .9 of all of that talk is rooted in is anti-Semitism. It's anti-Semitism. You dig on that just a little bit, and you're going to find that you're dealing with people who have some rabid, pathological need to blame everything that bad that happens in the world on the Jews. Um, sorry, I don't, I don't tolerate that crap. And that's what it is. It's crap. Interest is moral and it is utterly essential to a properly functioning economy. An economy cannot function without interest, which is why this zero interest rate environment that we're in is destroying us. There are two overarching political systems built upon the worthlessness and hatred of the individual man. Those two political systems are Marxism and Islam. There are also two political systems that forbid interest, and those political systems are Marxism and Islam. If you think that's a coincidence, I've got a big red bridge out in California that I'll sell to you real cheap. The reason that Marxism and Islam forbid interest is because they view the individual man as nothing, as less than nothing. Even less than nothing, it's built on the hatred of the individual man. And again, what's money? It's a proxy for the capacity of the individual man to labor, reason, and create. This is obvious. This is obvious. And yet, nobody can make these connections. Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, break out your scripture and read it. Even if you're, if you're not a Christian, even if you're an atheist, even anybody, read it. Because this, this positively shoots down the entire notion that there isn't supposed to be any interest. And there's a lot of really dim-witted Christians that are falling for this right now. So it has to be corrected. Roughly speaking, in very quick terms, the parable of the talents, there are three servants, and this is a parable. It's not an actual event that happened. It's Jesus telling a story, a parable, in order to make a point. There are three servants. The first servant is given, I think, uh, five talents, which is a unit of money. The second servant is given five, and the third servant is given one. Um, you might want to check that. I might have the quantities off. The master leaves. And then he comes back. When he comes back, the first servant who was given 10 talents, he's gone out, he's invested the money, he's doubled the money, okay? He's got 100% ROI. He gives the master back the original 10 in principle, and then he gives him back another 10. Great. Second servant, same deal. He takes his five, he goes out, invests it, generates 100% ROI, gives back the master the five in principle plus the plus additional five in profit. The third servant, very interesting. That's a servant that only got one talent. The third servant that only got one talent went and buried the thing in his backyard. 
And then when the master came back, he gave the master back the one talent, principle, and no return. Read what our Lord says in the scripture. You wicked servant. Thou oughtest therefore to have committed my money to the bankers, and at my coming I should have received my own with usury. It's out of the Douay Reims translation, which is the most authoritative translation there is. The word used is usury. You should have put it in the bank at bare minimum and returned it to me with interest. This is out of the lips of Christ himself. Yes, the parable of the talents is speaking about the spiritual gifts that we are given. You are obliged to use those gifts and then return them. Of course, that is the, the spiritual theological aspect of the parable. However, our Lord could not, would not, and did not, and will not ever use an, an evil activity if you're going to argue that interest is an evil activity, there's no way that he ever could have or ever would use interest as an example of a virtue. Do you see that? This is, this is so incredibly important. He's never going to use an evil activity to illustrate a virtue. And so just by virtue of the fact that our Lord used interest as an example of what somebody should have done in the parable tells us that interest, reasonable interest, not excessive interest, but reasonable interest is absolutely ratified. Not only that, but you could even argue by his use in, in this parable that it is economically essential, which it is. Okay, so any time, I, I just can't overemphasize this for all you Christians out there who are so ignorant and are being so poorly catechized and so poorly led by your brain dead, super fun rock band pastors, and I even hesitate to give them that title. You have to understand this. You can't have an economy that functions without interest. The moral and theological consequences to that are massive and awful. There are already numerous nations that are operating not only at a zero interest rate, but at a negative interest rate. You can jot these down if you want to. They are, right now, Switzerland, negative bond yields, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Finland, Austria, and almost, almost the United States. We are, for all intents and we are at zero okay, on, on treasury paper. And we will probably go negative within the next several months, I would guess. I don't know timelines, and it's always iffy to be making time projections, but we will go negative. So what does that mean? It means if you go to, for example, Denmark, and you buy a bond, you buy a one-year bond in Denmark, you give them a hundred whatever, euros, whatever, and at the end of the year, you get 99.50 back. You don't even get your full principal back. So you're paying Denmark to park your money with them. You have to pay someone else to park your money with them, and then you get less back afterwards. Why would people do this? Just for safety. This tells you how incredibly panicked and how much danger and counterparty risk people are perceiving right now that they'll give their money to these nations here, these northern, generally northern European nations, and they are so frightened of the markets and all of the counterparty risk that they will pay somebody just to let them park their money. It's completely upside down. This, this cannot persist. Page seven, the banking system defining the real problem. The real problem is unbacked, unsecured lending. That is the problem. Fractional reserve banking is not the problem per se, provided the reserve is non-zero and is enforced, meaning there's, there's a rule of law, okay? That's all we're saying. But fractional reserve banking can work, as we're gonna see here in a minute. That's not what the problem is. The problem is unbacked, unsecured lending. 
I want to put in a, a big plug right here for Carl Denninger and his great book, Leverage. I'm sourcing a lot conceptually out of his book. This next example I'm going to go through with this bank balance sheet um, is heavily sourced from his book. I highly recommend everybody buying Leverage, keeping a copy on hand. It's going to be kind of a, a little primer for um, what to do and how, how to roughly uh, devise economic systems after the collapse. So you should have it in your library. Hard copy on paper. Great, great book. God bless KD. All right, so on page seven in your workbook, here's our bank balance sheet. Fells Wargo bank balance sheet, 10% reserve requirement. That's our assumption, okay? First, top left, liabilities. $10,000 coming in in owner's capital, okay? Owner's capital coming in, 10000 essentially seeding the bank, right? And so now on the other side of the balance sheet, what have we got? We've got 10000 in cash. So this is a balance sheet, so that means that both sides should always balance. Do we balance? Yes, we're balancing right now. Very good. All right, so 10% res reserve requirement means that we have to keep 10% in the bank, and then we're free to loan out 90%. So that means that actually the way our balance sheet works out is we've got 1,000 in cash, and then we've got 9,000 to loan out. So let's say we uh, issue a car loan, a $9,000 car loan to Belinda, okay, on a $12,000 car. $9,000 loan on a $12,000 car, that means Belinda put down three grand, right? Belinda's got some equity in her car, but here we've got this loan on our books. All righty. So here's how the balance sheet now looks. 10,000 in seed capital on the liability side translates into $1,000 in cash plus the $9,000 car loan to Belinda. Okay, that's an asset. A lot of you who aren't familiar with banking, the one thing you got to get through your mind pretty quick is that a loan is an asset to the bank, okay? The loan is an asset. So Belinda goes and buys the car, and Crazy Eddie comes in. Crazy Eddie's the car dealer, and he deposits that $9,000 from Belinda buying the car, okay? Now, this is an extremely simplistic scenario. Of course, this wouldn't all be going through exactly the same bank, but it doesn't matter. In the macro sense, on the macro scale of the entire banking industry, this whole, this whole balance sheet concept still works, even though it isn't exactly the same bank. It doesn't have to be exactly the same bank. Okay, so Crazy Eddie deposited the nine grand that was loaned out to Belinda, Okay, so now 10% reserve requirement. That means we've got to keep 900 in cash. That's Crazy Eddie's cash. And that means that we have $8,100 free to loan out. So what do we do? We give Amy a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, on her home for $8,100. Again, that is an asset. Remember, Belinda's loan is an asset because why? If Belinda defaults on the loan, what does the bank have a lien on? The car, right? So they can go and recapture that. Amy, we're getting a little bit squishy here. Amy's HELOC, yeah, there's a lien involved. What's the lien on? On Amy's house, right? So if Amy defaults on her HELOC, they've got a lien on the house, they can recapture this. Here's where it gets a little messy. Amy's HELOC has a lien to secure it, but what happens if the real estate market crashes? As it just has precipitously over the last several years. What should the bank do as the real estate market falls? What should the bank do as the real estate market falls? Well, it should mark Amy's HELOC to the market every day. Her HELOC should be marked to the market every single day, and this would be very easy to do. You could have a nationwide or regional or statewide real estate index every day that banks had to use. And, you know, somebody, a central authority could calculate every single day, okay, how are we going to mark these things to the market, all right? And it could, it could be done very, very easily off of an index. 
It should mark Amy's HELOC to the market every day and post bank capital dollar for dollar to cover the shortfall, either with owner's cash or by the bank selling bonds. You see that? But one way or the other, what has to happen, what needs to happen, and after the collapse and rebuild, you have to understand this. These banks have to be honest on their books and their balance sheets about the values of these assets, of these loans. And as soon as an asset loses value, there has to be money posted by the bank on the other side in order to balance it out. If you just let it be a free-for-all and the banks can just go willy-nilly and they can, mark, they can mark their loan assets to whatever BS they want to, you're going to have another banking collapse all over again. You have to do this in order to fix the banking system. That's to whatever BS they want to, you're going to have another banking collapse all over again. You have to do this in order to fix the banking system. Okay? And again, it's either bank owner's capital coming in or the bank can sell bonds, right? So the bank is essentially borrowing money from investors. It's paying back interest on that. That's perfectly fine. That's fine too. All right, so this is what the balance sheet should look like. We gave Amy uh, initially an $8,100 HELOC, but the real estate market has fallen, so now it's only valued at six over here on the asset side. And so then what does, does the bank do to make up the other $2,100? Owner's capital infusion needs to come in here on the other side. Okay? And then that's your $2,100 in cash, bank owner cash right there. That balances, that's correct, and that's healthy but that's not what the banking industry does. This is good banking. There are only a relative handful of banks in the United States doing business like this. Most are small, privately held, rural banks. You know, that are some guy who's in his 60s, 70s, or 80s, who has a brain in his head, who's running his bank properly, who doesn't make bad loans, and when he does, there's always dollar for dollar, more than enough bank capital coming in on the other side so that if there is a default, nobody's at risk. The money is always there. There are only, there are only 300 and some odd banks with a perfect Texas ratio score, which is basically what that means. Not only that, but the FDIC and the bank inspectors come into those little banks that are doing business properly and they write them up and they browbeat them. Why, what do they write them up and browbeat them for? For having too much cash and not making enough loans. In other words, you, we insist, we are going to attempt to force you to do what's basically accounting fraud. And furthermore, we are going to punish you and browbeat you out of business if you refuse to give loans to people who you know have a massive risk of defaulting. Welcome, welcome to the world. Welcome to the United States of America. And let's be completely bold and upfront about this. A lot of all of that is driven on race lines, okay? You have to give somebody a loan if they walk in the door and they are not white. And if you don't give them a loan, then we're gonna write you up and you're, one of, you're a dirty fat cat, blah, blah, blah. I, ha I had a banker acquaintance. This is a true story. Guy walked in the bank, wanted to get a loan to buy a used vehicle, okay? Walked in, sat down in this gentleman's office who was the president of the bank, and it was a small rural bank, and he, the, the guy is sitting there. I would almost called him a kid, but he wasn't a kid because he was probably in his late 30s, and he's making the pitch to the banker why the banker should give him this loan to get this used vehicle. The guy is sitting there across from the banker, and he's wearing a T-shirt, and the T-shirt says, and I quote, what are you looking at, dick face? Just, just stop and think about that. What, what kind of a man would buy a T-shirt like that? What kind of a man would leave the house wearing a T-shirt like that? What kind of a man would walk into a banker's office asking for a loan wearing a T-shirt like that? 
And in this civilization, the banker is punished because he will not give the loan to the guy wearing the t-shirt saying, what are you looking at, dickface? Are, are, are you wondering why our entire civilization is going to collapse? That's it right there. That's it right there in a nutshell. So the way this balance sheet should look is, or excuse me, I just showed you what it should look like. This is the reality. This is the disgusting reality. They leave Amy's HELOC on their asset side at 8100 valued it at full price, even though the real estate market has collapsed. It's only worth 6000 this balance sheet does not balance. In fact, this is a crime. This is accounting fraud. Failure to mark Amy's HELOC to the market is accounting fraud, but this is legalized. It's not just legalized. It is encouraged. It is mandated. It is forced by the government. They've been fo these banks have been forced into this. And now, you know, they're just going along with it happily. And there's only a handful of guys who still insist upon doing business correctly. This, this will never work. You can't have a banking system survive like this. If Amy defaults on her HELOC and the bank owners cannot come up with the 2100 to cover the difference, where will the 2100 come from? It's going to come from the depositors. And you say, well, no, Ann, that's not right. There's FDIC insurance. W what do you think FDIC is? It's a tax on every one of you. Because if, if banks fail and the FDIC doesn't have the money to, to pay out on this, and if there's a big enough collapse, how's that money going to come into the FDIC? The Fed's going to print it and give it to them, <laughs> which is doing what? debasing the currency, which means it's a tax on every one of you. So the depositors will pay for it one way or another, be it directly by having their, their accounts uh, swept, which will eventually happen at the very end stages of all of this. And in the interim, it'll just be via government bailout, government bailout, government bailout, which is just the Federal Reserve printing money, which is just debasing the U.S. dollar, which is a tax on you. Okay, so Amy takes her $8,100 HELOC, and let's say, just for example, she decides to put on a deck, okay? And Lou is the deck guy. So she puts on a deck, Lou comes in and deposits the 8100, and now here's 810 in cash in Lou's account. And the bank, therefore, has $7,290 that it can loan out. Now it's going to get really hairy and disgusting, because what does the bank do? It opens a credit card account for Michelle, and Michelle takes the 7290 bucks on her credit card and buys a luxury vacation. Okay, now before, with Amy's HELOC, we've got to lean on the house, right? At least there's, there's a piece of physical property that can be recaptured if, if she defaults. Same with Belinda. Belinda's got this car. Okay, you can repo the car. What about Michelle's luxury vacation on her credit card? What's the lien on there? Nothing, because the, the luxury vacation is experiential. It's not physical. This is, a, this is an unsecured, unbacked loan. It is basically a signature loan to Michelle, unbacked. This is what the entire economy is basically running on right now. This is how people are buying food. This is how people are filling up their gas tanks. And you're going to see a chart of that here in a second. Michelle's vacation on her credit card is totally unsecured. It's a promise by Michelle to pay back the loan with her future earnings. Again, time being money. Michelle is just saying over the next two, three, four, five years, I will pay you back out of my capacity to labor and produce over the next X number of years. Since the money to pay back Michelle's loan does not exist, right? It doesn't exist yet because she hasn't done the work to generate the money. 
This constitutes naked short selling the currency that the loan was made in, which in this case is US dollars. Another word for this is counterfeiting. That's what all of this is. All of this unsecured lending, all of these unsecured credit cards, all of this debt is shorting the currency. It's like, I mean, it's 10 times. It's orders of magnitude. It's hundreds of times, thousands of times. Anything that anybody could do with a printing press in a back room, like what they had in the old days. Oh, counterfeiting is is what this entire economy is built on. Nobody's making dollars with printing presses anymore. That's not how it's done. This is how it's done. Unsecured lending. And it has to stop. It has to stop. The bank can issue the credit card to Michelle if it wants to, if it thinks that she's a, 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 good, a good risk. But what the bank has to do is it has to post the $7,290 on the other side to fully back it. If they don't post that and if they don't back it, they are counterfeiting U.S. dollars. They're shorting the currency, naked shorting the currency. So how do we finish this off? Okay, Michelle goes on her cruise. The cruise line deposits the $7,290. And then there's the 7,290 in cash on the other side. And that's your balance sheet. That's the completed balance sheet. Okay? Now we're going to do some math off of this here. The $10 trillion question is this. What happens if Crazy Eddie and Lou, Crazy Eddie and Lou, walk into the bank to withdraw their balances? Okay? Let's think this through. If you look on your balance sheet, Crazy Eddie's balance is nine grand, right? Does everybody see that? Crazy Eddie, he has nine grand. Lou has 8,100. So the total of that is 17,100. Does the bank have 17,100 if Crazy Eddie and Lou walk in the door? No, they don't. How much cash does the bank have? Again, look at your balance sheet. Start at the top on the asset side. Owner's cash sitting in the bank is 1,000. That's the reserve requirement, remember? Crazy Eddie's cash per the reserve requirement on hand is 900. Lou's cash per the reserve requirement on hand is 8,100. And then if you remember the cruise line, we stopped with the cruise line, so we didn't do a reserve requirement. We had to end it somewhere, so that's the end, was 7,290. If you total that up, look what it comes out to. It's the original 10 grand, right? That's all they have. But Crazy Eddie and Lou, they've got between them 17,1 on deposit. What happens? What is going to happen if Crazy Eddie and Lou walk in and say, give me my money? Where are they going to get the shortfall of 7100 Well, they could sell Belinda's car loan into the secondary market. That would be possible, so they could do it that way. Um, could, they, could they sell Amy's HELOC? No. Why can't they sell Amy's HELOC? Because it's underwater, it's 20, it, it would be a $2,100 loss if they try to sell that HELOC into the secondary market they're only going to get 6000 for it because that's all it's worth in the market if you execute on it today. But they've got it booked at 8100 So not only can they not sell Amy's HELOC, they, they would be $2,100 even worse off if they did because they'd have to recognize that on their balance sheet if they moved it, you see? So they can't touch Amy's HELOC. They can't sell that. And then what? Are you going to sell Michelle's loan? Are you going to sell Michelle's credit card into the secondary market? Yeah, good luck with that. Completely non-collateralized. There's nothing against it. Are you think you're going to get $7,290 from Michelle's credit? Uh, no, 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 no. So really, the only thing that is maybe even possible is Belinda's car loan. Now, what if I told you that the 2008 TARP bill set all reserve requirements in the United States at zero? We've been using a 10% reserve requirement. The 2008 TARP bill lowered all reserve requirements to zero.
In the name of what? In the name of boosting liquidity and stimulus. Oh, we got to get these banks more liquid. We got to get them, you know, issuing these loans to stimulate the economy. Boys and girls, to say it's a house of cards, a house of cards is like a steel cage compared to the United States banking system. The reserve requirements are minuscule, or I shouldn't even say the reserve requirements, just the reserves being held are minuscule. If Crazy Eddie and Lou demand their cash, this will constitute a bank run, and the money will come from the depositors. Again, one way or the other, it's coming from the depositors. Either it's going to come out of their, their sacrosanct segregated deposit accounts, or it's going to come from the depositors and everyone else in the form of government bailouts, which has already happened and happening and continues to happen. And the Fed has said is it, is that it will go on ad infinitum, Q-eternity. Okay, he's just going to keep buying and buying and buying treasury paper, which is going to, again, be funneled back into the banks. Okay? Well, you say, well, what about FDIC insurance? Seriously? What, what about FDIC insurance, huh? Well, let's see. U.S. total bank deposits today are somewhere between 8 and 10 trillion dollars. Trillion. Between 8 and 10 trillion. How much cash on hand do you think the FDIC has? Well, let's think. 8 to 10 trillion in deposits, and the FDIC has those plaques on every, every teller station, every drive up. Uh, little suction tube station, there's that plaque that says all deposits up to $250,000 backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. If we've got between 8 and 10 trillion in deposits, how much do you think that the FDIC has on hand? Try 11 billion. Between 8 and 10 trillion in deposits, 11 billion in FDIC assets as of the latest numbers. And realize that a couple of years ago, the FDIC was actually in the hole. They had less than zero. What they had to do in 2000, and I believe it was 2009, is they had to collect three years worth of premiums in advance because they were completely insolvent and in the hole. And in order to get themselves to the point where they had any money at all, they had to collect three years of premiums from the banks in advance. And even with that, right now, they're sitting with 11 billion. Good luck with that. So if we think about this, what if 25% of the banking capacity in the United States fails? OK, we're looking at billions of dollars, billions of dollars excuse me, trillions of dollars. See, I, even I get confused with these numbers. You're looking at trillions of dollars, and you've got 11 billion to cover it. OK, so what, what would happen? How would they come up with the money? Bernanke would print. And by print, understand, again, we're not talking about printing with printing presses. We're talking about the Federal Reserve opening up their computer spreadsheet and just typing in one, zero 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 enter trillion bucks there you go buy u.s bonds and then it goes to the banks that's what we're talking about here and every time they do that it debases the currency and it causes inflation which is why when you go to the store the last time i went to the store just me just little old me 150 bucks buying groceries wow 150 bucks for just a single person buying a few groceries. Why do you think this is happening? Because our currency is being massively, monstrously, willfully, consciously debased and destroyed. The Obama regime has so far debased the currency by, what, six trillion dollars? Six trillion? Yeah. In a 15 and a half trillion dollar GDP kind of an economy, you've, de you've debased by the currency by flirting with half the GDP. You think there's no consequences for this? You think this can just go on and on and on and on? No. In fact, the damage is so profound and so far along that critical mass has been reached and we can't walk it back. There's nothing that can be done now to walk this back. 
When the banking system collapses, you will pay for it one way or another. The Federal Reserve will print their way out of it, thus debasing the currency, thus causing hyperinflation, thus robbing buying power from every person holding U.S. dollars. And there will be hell to pay. Moral. Moving to a sound bank is not a complete solution. You will still be exposed to hyperinflation risk if holding wealth denominated in U.S. dollars. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to find one of those really good little rural banks with the really awesome bank president who understands all this. It'll, it'll stave you off, but that doesn't shield you from inflation at all. Inflation is a macro systemic dynamic. Where your money is sitting in whose bank isn't going to protect you against that. Uh, hyperinflation is, a, is an equal opportunity destroyer. It will destroy everybody equally in proportion to the number of dollars that they hold. It will destroy everybody equally in proportion to the number of dollars that they hold. The banking paradigm just shown exists all over the world. It isn't just us. The entire global economy is a giant debt bubble propped up by massive de facto currency counterfeiting and hot air. The whole thing is counterfeiting and hot air, and it is going to implode. This is a mathematical and moral certainty. Solution. The one dollar of capital, and that's Carl Denninger's term for it, the one dollar of capital banking with a reserve with a reasonable reserve requirement is the way to go. So banks can issue unsecured loans. They just have to post bank capital on the other side, dollar for dollar. That's why he calls it one dollar of capital. And the same thing goes to being honest about marking to the market every single day all of these physical loan assets, namely in the form of real estate. That nips this whole real estate bubble dynamic in the bud if you force the banks to post the differential when the real estate market deflates. Banks must mark loan assets to the market daily and post bank capital for every dollar of shortfall and unsecured loans. And again, I'm sourcing from Denninger on that because he's 100% correct. And here is the Denninger axiom. There has not been a single three-month period in the U.S. wherein GDP growth outpaced new debt since 1980. I'm now on page 10. In other words, the entire U.S. economy is a massive, massive debt bubble. And here we are on page 10. This is Denninger's very, very famous chart. And it is, it is brilliant, and it says absolutely everything that you need to know. What is this? This is debt and GDP change net-net quarterly. The blue line is debt. The red line is is GDP. Okay? The x-axis is time by quarter. This is Q1 1980 and it goes over to, I think it's current to 2012, like Q2 2012, something like that. The y-axis is a little confusing so we need to go over it. Look at, look at what the chart title says. Debt and GDP change net-net quarterly. So it's not absolute. What this is, is every quarter is compared to the previous quarter. And if, let's say for example, if GDP went up relative to the last quarter, the slope goes up, okay? And you're above zero, okay? So you're at a positive, you're at a positive increase in GDP relative to the previous quarter. So it's not absolute numbers of GDP, because you can see that we're just hovering in this band right here. Every time there's a quarter above zero, that means that there was growth relative to the previous quarter. The question is, was it more growth or less growth? Okay, and then the blue line, it's the same dynamic. Every time where you have an increase, an upslope, that means that the debt increased faster than in the previous quarter, and if you're above zero, it means that there was just an absolute increase in debt. It's a, little bit, it's a little bit confusing because people are used to looking at charts that are just absolute numbers, and what this is, is it's, it's charting the change quarter to quarter, okay? So stop and think about this. What this is saying 
is that, yeah, GDP, since this is the zero line right here, GDP has been growing most quarters. Here's a down, and it just barely went under zero. That would be a little bit of a contraction. This would be a little bit of a contraction. Here's a contraction here. Here's a big, big contraction here. That's 2008. Okay, but mostly, relative to the previous quarter, the GDP is just gently, gently growing, okay? Gent gentle growth with this mess over here. Look what the debt is doing at the same time. And this is overall debt. It's the debt increase is always above the GDP increase. There's just, there's a tiny quarter right here and then you have to get over into there before you have any instances where the debt growth was not in excess of the GDP growth. That right there tells you we've got a problem, okay? If you want to have any conversation about delevering at all, what does that mean? That means that the blue line has to be beneath the red line. That is delevering. Anytime the blue line is above the red line, that's not delevering. That's more leverage. And then Denninger's point is this phase right here, I mean, look at this, this increase in debt. This is criminal. People should be tried for treason and upon conviction be put against a wall and shot for this because this is economic treason. L look, at, look at this. Look at this. Right here. This point here and this point here, that's a seven to one ratio, which means in order to get one dollar of GDP growth down here, they had to pump seven dollars worth of new debt into the economy to get one dollar of GDP growth. And this is, what is this? This is 2004. This is, this is 2007, 2008, and then this is the great collapse of 2008 right here. And yes, the blue line went under zero and it went under the red line, but oh no, we have to, we have to bail everybody out and we have to get it back up and into, the, into that increase the leverage dynamic again. Okay? Th this is terrifying. This entire economy since Carter has just been blowing and blowing and blowing a massive debt bubble. The deleveraging will happen, it must happen, and it is going to happen soon. And you, I mean, think about that. Think about, think about the technological advancements since Carter. Think about all of the things that have been added to the economy and then and then ponder what that deleverage is going to look like and what's going to happen. We're talking about civilizational consequences here, existential civilizational consequences, because this will have to be deflated. It will, it will happen. The universe will not allow that to go un uninflated. All the computers, the, the, the advent of the internet, the advent of the internet is right here, okay? And one could argue that, that that is kind of the beginning of when the big explosion started to come. Sure, you could make that argument. Historians will, will parse through all of this and will be writing about all of this for centuries, if not millennia, to come about what, what has happened here and this bubble. It's terrifying. All right, so now that we understand that, let's go through the debt cycle so that the layman out there watching can understand what exactly is going on. Okay, we're on page 11 in your book and I've got everything color coded. So you guys in the audience might have to help me with the colors. Um, you start at the top in that top rectangle. Step one of the debt cycle is Spain sells sovereign bonds at 6%. Okay, here we are, we're Spain. We are going to sell sovereign paper. We're going to offer it at 6%. But, Anne, the United States is at zero. Yeah, I know. Spain is a hot mess. That's why they have to pay 6% on their paper. Okay? So, arrow down, and then on the green box, kind of on the right-hand side of your paper, here's the next step. 
other broke nations, banks, and investment firms borrow money at or near 0%, like say, for example, if you're a broker dealer in the United States, like MF Global, you go to the discount window at the Fed, you borrow money from the Fed at 0%, and then what do you do? You turn around and buy Spanish bonds at six with the money that you just borrowed with the Fed. How, what's the spread there? How many basis points? 600 basis points, 6%, six, 6%, six okay? All right, now in the blue box, kind of on the left-hand side of your book, European Central Bank prints euros and buys sovereign bonds directly in unlimited quantity. That's the Draghi proclamation of September 6, 2012. The European Central Bank, they aren't even being coy about it anymore. They're not just printing euros, giving the euros to the banks and then letting it trickle into the sovereign paper market through banks. He's not even being cute about it anymore. The European Central Bank is now buying euros and buying sovereign bonds from these European nations directly. I cannot even begin to tell you how bad that is. That is the, the incestuous and the, the fundamental catastrophic disorder with that is just, is, can't even be described, to have a central bank buying the sovereign paper directly. Okay, next square down, which I believe is purple. As Spain sells more and more bonds, which is issuing debt, the Spanish debt to GDP ratio rises. Okay, if you've got this nation that's a hot mess to start with and they keep blowing their debt bubble and their debt to GDP ratio just keeps going up and up and up, as the market looks at that sovereign nation, in this, in this case Spain, what is, the, what is the market's perception? Is that better or worse? It's worse. So if it's worse, what does that do to the interest rate? it pushes it up even more, okay? So you see it's this, it's this cannibalistic eating your own tail dynamic. The more debt you blow, the higher your interest rate goes, okay? Next step, turquoise, I believe. As Spain's debt to GDP rises, the economy weakens. We're blowing a big debt bubble, we're a hot mess. The economy weakens, the economy slows down, it goes into a recession, unemployment rises. Next step down, I believe that box is red. As economy weakens, the Spanish government increases debt, calling it stimulus and welfare. Because remember, as the economy weakened because of the increasing debt to GDP ratio, more people are going on welfare and more people are demanding the government to do something. Well, what, is, what should the government do? Well, more stimulus, more stimulus, more stimulus. Well, wait a minute, that's just more new debt which increases the debt to GDP ratio, which just makes the economy weaken even more. And it just keeps cycling and cycling and cycling. Next, the gold box. As Spain's economy weakens further, customers start defaulting on loans because people are losing their jobs. We're in a recession. Of course people are going to start defaulting on loans. Now, think back to what we just looked at on the Fels Wargo balance sheet, right? Amy defaulting on her HELOC, Michelle defaulting on her credit card. Secured loans, such as real estate, are booked as being worth far more than they actually are, and unsecured loans are unsalvageable. The entire banking system is revealed to be insolvent. Bank runs begin. This is going on. This is already happening in Greece, in Spain, and to some extent it's been happening in Italy as well. Okay, the, the, the poop is hitting the fan in the beginning phases in Europe, and that's what's coming here. Next, the, blue, the green box. Systemic risk increases, thus raising interest rates in Spain. If there are bank runs going on and banks are failing left and right, what does that do to the interest rate market? Well, if I'm going to... Do this, if I'm going to give you my money bank, I better be making a lot more than 0% on it in order to take on that risk. Interest rates and risk are positively correlated in a, in a normal uh, economic environment. As interest rates increase, Spain needs to borrow more money to service its sovereign debt and to bail out banks. 
okay, not only do they have to borrow more money just to pay the interest on the debt that they already have, does anybody here in the room remember that in the, like in the early 80s coming off of Carter when people would literally have to go and take out loans just to make the interest payment on another loan? Borrowing money just to make the interest payment? Yeah, yeah. And so blowing the debt bubble even more, and then it has to bail out the banks because the banks are failing, right? So what does Spain have to do? It has to borrow more money from the European Central Bank in order to bail out its banks. This, this just keeps going and going and feeding on itself and feeding on itself. They're not, they're not helping anything over in Europe. They're just making it worse and worse and worse. Why are they doing this? A, because they're a bunch of political whores who will do anything to maintain their position of power. Anything. Number two, a lot of them are imbeciles and do not understand even this simple logical progression. I cannot overemphasize this. Stupid people are running the world. Okay, this whole politically correct thing has been one big culture of let's elevate people who are stupid into positions of massive power to prove how morally superior we are. Guys, this has got to stop. Intelligent people have got to reassert their primacy in the arena of ideas and governance. Oh my gosh, I can't believe she just, says, she just said that. That sounds so racist. I don't give a crap. Smart people should be running things. Stupid people should not. This isn't unchristian. This is truth. You have to get this through your minds. Oh, and by the way, when you encounter people that are criminal psychopaths who will steal and rape and pillage and will do it without any moral hesitancy or compunction whatsoever, there's a solution for that. It's called execution after due process trial and conviction. We have to start executing these people because that is the only thing that they will ever understand and that is the only way that it will ever, ever stop. Justice, there must be justice. If there is no justice in a society or a culture, that culture is doomed. Period, full stop, end of story. There must be justice. And that means for some of these people, execution. At the head of that list for me right now is needless to say, John Corzine, who stole $1.6 billion worth of customer segregated funds and has contributed to, the, to economic consequences all over the world. Destruction of the markets themselves. If I walked into a liquor store and turned it over for 50 bucks, I would spend 10 years in prison. If John Corzine steals 1.6 billion, he should be put against a wall and shot for the good of humanity and also for his own good. Because if he is not punished, he will never repent. He will never repent. If, he, if, if all he sees is living the rest of his life in a villa in the south of France on the Riviera as the consequence of his crime, is he ever going to get on his knees and beg God for forgiveness? The answer is no. So if you're a Christian, and you're really thinking about the ends, the, the true ends of these men. It's either heaven or hell. Do I want John Corzine to go to hell? Believe it or not, no, I don't. I don't want John Corzine to burn in hell for all eternity. But the, it seems to me that the only way that a man like that, who is so morally far gone, could ever get on his knees and feel any sense of repentance at all as if he was faced with his own morality in the context of an imminent execution. Can you deal with this? Or do you just want to go through the rest of your life doing this nicey nice crap? Well, we got to be nice to everybody. That's fine. It will destroy your civilization and the civilization that your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and all further generations will live under. 
You want to be nice, you want to be well-liked and well-loved, and you don't want to talk about unpleasant things, that's fine, but you are consigning your progeny to hell in order to have that benefit. What a disgusting, self-centered trade-off. And so we loop it back up to the beginning and we start all over again because where did, we, where did we end with? Spain needs to borrow more money to service its sovereign debt. It needs to borrow more money. And so we're back up to the very beginning. Spain issues debt. Okay? It's a snake eating its own tail. Exactly the same thing is happening in the U.S. with the U.S. Treasury paper being bought by the Federal Reserve as the U.S. government runs up massive debt and bails out banks. When U.S. interest rates uptick, the last vestiges of the now dead republic will implode. This is a mathematical inevitability. Obama alone, and it isn't, it isn't just Obama, don't get me wrong. I'm not some George W. Bush fangirl standing here. No way, no way. But the damage that Obama has done, that regime has done, is so massive, and it was consciously done. It's called the Cloward Piven strategy. It was done with malice aforethought. And it was consciously done. It's called the Cloward Piven strategy. It was done with malice aforethought. The damage that that has done and the amount of debt, of new debt, and that, remember guys, that debt was issued in basically a zero interest rate environment. So that's your starting point. Zero percent interest. If there is any uptick in interest rates, if the Federal Reserve basically loses its grip on the markets and that the actual interest rate market is allowed, is allowed to emerge in the United States, just having the interest rate uptick from 0% to 3%, which 3% was historically extremely low, just going from 0 to 3, that will mathematically implode the entire system. Just that. We are so painted into a corner with so much debt issued in a zero interest rate environment that any uptick in interest rates will destroy, I mean, we're talking civilizational collapse type destruction. And like I said, it is a mathematical inevitability. You, are you going to make the argument that interest rates are going to stay at zero forever? Forever. Because that's what would have to happen. This is the largest financial crime in human history. Uh, that's the understatement of the day right there. This is the largest wealth transfer ever seen by many orders of magnitude. You can look back for some historical analogs. You can try to make analogs to Rome and so forth. But I mean, in terms of scope, there's an, there is no comparison. Now on page 12, the wealth transfer in the European context. What's happening in Europe is Germany and other northern European nations who are on better financial footing. They're not on good footing, but they're at least better than the southern European countries. Okay? The northern European nations are suffering a debased euro from the European Central Bank printing, while Spain and the other southern European nations have their currency effectively propped up. See, there's a euro, the euro currency in Europe now. It's not the Spanish currency or the, and the Deutsche Mark and the French franc and all of these different currencies with all of these different exchange rates. What these jackals did was they put in place the euro currency so that everybody is using the same currency. So what that means is that Germany should have right now, if there was a Deutsche Mark, Germany should have a relatively strong Deutsche Mark. Spain should have a, relative, a relatively weak peseta. And instead, they both have exactly the same euro with exactly the same buying power. So if you think about it, what that means is that the buying power of the German people is being transferred, is being confiscated and forcibly transferred to the people of Spain and Italy, and Portugal, and Greece, and so on and so forth. You see that? 
you're robbing from Germany in order to bail out Spain. <laughs> what happened the last time we tried to do that? This constitutes a massive transfer of wealth from Germany to Spain. What happened the last time Germany was forced to transfer its wealth to the rest of Europe? It was called the Treaty of Versailles. It was signed after World War I. Germany, as the aggressors in World War I, were, were made to pay reparations to the rest of Europe, in a sense, for World War I. The problem was that the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, paying those reparations, were so extreme that it just bled Germany to death. And you say, well, they had it coming for World War I. Yeah, but we've got to think beyond this, because if you destroy these people's economy and there opens up a power vacuum and there's hyperinflation and people are angry and people are desperate and people are in absolute poverty, what does that enable to happen? It allows the ascendancy of some truly, truly nefarious characters. In fact, one of the most nefarious characters in all of human history. That is how Hitler came to power, is through this confiscation of wealth out of, out of Germany and into the rest of Europe. The Treaty of Versailles was reparations for German aggression in World War I. This time, this time, Germany is being punished just for having a stronger economy. I mean, it, with, with this dynamic, you, you could say, yeah, well, World War I, come on, guys, you've got you to make good on that. There isn't even anything like that going on right now. It's just, Germany, you suck because you have a stronger economic system than the fools in Spain and the fools in Italy. And so we're just going to punish you for, in effect, being better. Guys, this is extremely real and extremely dangerous. The, there are neo-Nazi factions coming to power as we speak in Europe especially in Greece. The neo-Nazi party in Greece holds a non-trivial percentage of the Greek parliament right now. And these movements are, are rising all over Europe. You cannot do this. And that, this also applies somewhat to the United States. Obama the man isn't who I fear because Obama the man is a slack-jawed, mouth-breathing, drug-addled, sodomite imbecile. I don't fear Obama the man. What everybody needs to watch out for is whoever comes up behind him. Oh, be careful. Oh, be so careful. You have to be so careful with these people who come up out of economic collapse and ruin because that, that's your dictator right there. In the U.S. context of wealth transfer on page 13, right now the Federal Reserve prints money to bail out criminal banks who are engaging in massive accounting fraud with the government's full knowledge and encouragement, as we talked about earlier. The Fed also subsidizes with printing profligate government spending. Much of it is fraud, like Solyndra, okay? All of these, all of these solar outfits, every single one of them, they have nothing to do with energy. They have nothing to do with the environment or anything green. These are scam shell companies set up by political cronies of this oligarch class. And all of this money going into these solar and so-called green companies is nothing more than the looting of the United States Treasury by the oligarch class. Solyndra never had any intention of producing anything. None of these companies ever had any intention of producing anything. And the proof is in the pudding. Take Solyndra, for example. In September of 2010, Solyndra was issued a guaranteed government loan of $500 million, half a billion dollars. Twelve months later, there were padlocks on the front door. Now, there are some businessmen in the room here. Just think about that. You're setting up a business, you're in the warm-up phases, and you, and you get in a half a billion dollars. It would take it far in excess of 12 months to even get warmed up on a half a billion dollar type of a, a business model. And yet Solyndra 
had locks on the doors 12 months later. That, that was looting. It's all just government looting. It is 100% theft and criminality. There is nothing about any of that that has any legitimacy whatsoever. That's what's going on. That's where your tax money is going. You're paying taxes and it's going straight into the hands of these political cronies and oligarchs. This is one of the reasons, a sub-reason, why I've declared a federal tax strike. I'm not doing this anymore. The being forced to pay for abortion is, of course, number one on that list, but this is on the list, too. I am not going to work and work and work and write these quarterly tax checks to the federal government so that the federal government can turn around and hand this money to their criminal oligarch buddies. I'm not playing anymore. Atlas shrugged playing out in real life. Here it is. Here it is. I'm going galt. I'm not playing. The Federal Reserve artificially keeps interest rates low, thus robbing savers of any interest income, while real-world price inflation increases the cost of living. Think about the retired class in this country right now. These people are, were basically living off of interest, okay? They have been deprived of almost all of their interest income by this zero interest rate environment. Plus, at the same time, they're, they're looking at real world cost of living inflation. They're getting it on both sides. This is a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class to the oligarch class, i.e. mega banks, politically connected corporations, and almost all politicians. And to a lesser temporary extent, the underclass. But the underclass dynamic, the Obama phones and the welfare, that is very, very temporary. That is just an end, that is just a means to the end. This is classic textbook historical Marxism. Okay? You, you gin up revolution amongst the underclass, you bribe them and pay them off and get them to, to give you power in a democratic way by giving them free crap and then once they no longer serve any purpose, what happens to the underclass? What happened to the underclass under Lenin? What happened to the underclass under Mao? They were murdered and they were murdered by the tens of millions. So you, you stand up here and say, well, I, I'm some elitist and I don't care about the little guy. Are you out of your mind? I love the underclass. They are being set up for a genocide, a holocaust, an economic genocide. They are being lined up like lambs to the slaughter, just exactly like the, uh, the proletariat under Lenin and Stalin, and just exactly like the Chinese peasants under Mao, who were murdered by the tens of millions. Am I, do I think I'm more intelligent than they are? Yes, I do. And that's why I have the responsibility to fight this and try to notify them. Yeah, does, does Pookie in the inner city have any idea what he's being set up for? No. Does that Obama phone lady have any idea what she's being set up for? No, she doesn't. And it is the moral responsibility of people like me and you who understand this and have the intelligence to comprehend this and have the historical knowledge to recognize these patterns playing out all over again. It is our moral responsibility to step into the breach and to stand in front of those people and defend them. And you want to call me arrogant because I acknowledge the fact that I'm more intelligent than the Obama phone lady? That's fine. Call me arrogant all day long. But don't you dare say that I didn't step in the, in the breach. And as much as I despise that woman's lifestyle, as much as I despise that lifestyle, she doesn't deserve a bullet in the head. And that's what's coming from this government to people like her. Over my dead body. Some combination of default, secession, and war is how this is going to play out. That is the solution. Some combination of default, secession, and war in the United States. Secession movements are already moving throughout Europe. And how can you blame them? 
Catalonia, which is where Barcelona, Spain is. It's, on the, it's in the northeast corner of Spain on the Mediterranean, right up against the French Riviera. They're moving to secede from Spain. Why wouldn't they? The Basque, which is the uh, north central region of Spain, right there on the Pyrenees Mountains. Now, granted, the Basque have wanted to secede ever since time immemorial, but now they're really, really getting momentum to get out of Spain. Flemish Belgium, not the French speaking part, but the Flemish uh, speaking part of Belgium, they're moving to secede. Venice is moving to secede from Italy. Venice has historically been its own republic, and in fact, they even speak a slightly different language. They don't speak pure Italian in Venice. They even have their own language. They are looking to secede from Italy to get away from this poison. Scotland is looking to secede from the UK. Can you blame any of these groups? No, you can't. They're looking for self-preservation. They're looking to get away from these poisoned central banks and central governments. And the, the corollary to that is, yes, indeed, the United States may balkanize. You bet it could. Could I, could I see a Texas leaving if it got bad enough? Yes, I sure could. And if Texas leaves, you know Oklahoma's going to go with them. You know a bunch of other people are going to go with Texas. Wyoming, I could see a Wyoming seceding. Now, is this a good thing? No, it isn't, because one of the most important tactical advantages we have in the United States is the landmass with these two enormous oceans on either side. And if the United States does balkanize, all you need to do is look at an electoral map to figure out what's going to happen. The communists, these, these neo-Stalinist idiots, are concentrated on the seaboards. Okay, the halfway, halfway intelligent people, constitutionalists, let's call them, are concentrated more or less in the center of the land mass. If the United States balkanizes, the neo-Stalinists are going to have the seaports. And when their economies fail, either we're going to have to bail them out, or they're going to be begging the Chinese to come in from the West, and the Pacific seaports, and they're going to be begging the Russians to come in and the UN to come in on the eastern ports. And then what? And then what? We're flanked. We're flanked in the middle of the United States and it's over. So do I see balkanization happening in the United States? Yes, I do. And it terrifies me. It absolutely terrifies me. You know, I, I've learned to see the Civil War in in a more illuminated way over the last several years, but I will give Lincoln this. I will give Lincoln this. I presume that what Lincoln was probably thinking was that if the Confederacy was allowed to break away and survive, that it would just become a proxy puppet state for Europe. And he said, I don't, we're not, we can't have this. We can't have the French or the English or any of these other European concerns basically running the southern half of this continent through the Confederacy. And I think that was probably one of the, the main reasons in his mind why he was thinking that the Union had to be maintained. Because of the, the literal tactical look at the map, this is not going to be good, this is going to be a disaster if we allow this thing to break apart. And in retrospect, he was right. And we need to, to heed that lesson again. And it, what, what that implies is fighting another civil war. Fighting another civil war just so that the people with common sense who are kind of in favor of the Constitution so that we can keep tactical control of the seaports out of the hands of these neo-Stalinist imbeciles who would be the death of us all if given half the chance. And, and, we, and we let it get to this. And we let it get to this. All right, let's talk about credit default swaps on page 14. You need to understand this, even if you're a person who says, I don't have anything to do with any of this. This is credit default swaps. That sounds really complicated. I don't, you need to understand this because this is what is destroying the financial system. 
And like I said on the very first slide, you deserve to know why. You deserve to know what's going on. And what you'll see is that this stuff isn't very complicated. It's just typical nonsense where these people that are in power put these crazy names on all this stuff and try to dazzle you all out there with BS and try to make you think that, well, there's no way that you simple peasants out there could ever possibly understand any of this high finance. Really, it's, it's quite simple, and you need to understand it so that you can fight back against it. Okay, page 14. U.S. banks and investment entities buy Spanish bonds, let's say. We've been talking about Spain, so let's stick with Spain. What happens if Spain defaults, which is a very real possibility with all of these European countries now? What happens if Spain defaults on their bonds? Well, number one, Citibank borrows money from the Federal Reserve at 0%. So Citibank goes to the discount window, gets as much money as it wants from the Federal Reserve, and gets it at 0%. Next step, Citibank uses that money to buy Spanish bonds at 6%. So it's kind of the same dynamic as we were with before. We've got this 6% 6 spread. Citibank buys credit default swaps on Spanish debt from either J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs. Those are the two big purveyors of credit default swaps. Those are the guys who are writing these insurance policies. And you'll see that they're just glorified insurance policies. What Citibank does is it pays J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs 1% or 100 basis points in return J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs agrees to guarantee Citibank Spanish bonds in the event of a Spanish default. So there's the credit default aspect of credit default swap. If Spain defaults on their credit, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs says, we will step in and we will make you whole in exchange for you paying us this premium right here. As you can see, this is just insurance, okay? us this premium right here. As you can see, this is just insurance, okay, so far. In return, if a default happened, Citi would surrender the Spanish bonds to J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, whoever the counterparty is, who would then get to keep any salvage value, okay? So if there's a default, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs make Citibank whole right off the bat. Okay, it's insurance. In exchange for that, plus the premium, Citibank gives the remnants of the bonds back to J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, and they get to keep the salvage value. So that is the swap aspect. That's the swap aspect of the credit default swap. That, that's all it really is. Okay, for any of you out there here in the room or on YouTube who know what a put option is. Yeah, this is just basically a kind of a glorified put option, isn't it? That's all it is. J.P. Morgan Goldman Sachs is writing insurance policies on sovereign debt. Credit default swaps are glorified proxy put options, in this case, on entire nations. Now stop, 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 stop. You have investment banks writing put options on entire nations. Stop and sit in stillness with that for a second. Are, are we seeing a problem with this? On entire nations. How in the world is J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs going to pay out on something like this? How in the world are they going to pay out? How does J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs protect itself? Well, number one, by bribing the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, ISDA, to never declare a default. This has already happened once. Greek, Greece defaulted. I mean, it, total, it totally failed. It was a total default. ISDA said, no, there was some salvage value there, so it wasn't a default. Nobody has to pay out on anything. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. Credit default swaps have as built into their, even their name, the notion that, yeah, even in the event of a default, there will be salvage. The, the salvage is built into the paradigm. So arguing, well, if there's still some salvage left over, then it's not a default, that, that makes no sense. 
This is the ISDA just acting as the bribed proxy for JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. Never ever declare a legal default no matter what happens so that these two firms never ever have to pay out. So all they do is they receive premiums, receive premiums, receive premiums, and they, they know that they will never have to pay out. The other way is by, is by J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs sending its employees and agents into the governments and central banks to provide bailouts. Look, look at the list of people who are running the Federal Reserve, the United States Treasury, on and on, um, the European Central Bank, um, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Look at the roster of these people and then look at their immediate past employment history. These, these outfits, these banks, these governments, they are populated by people coming straight out of J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs especially, and a handful of these other mega banks. Why in the world would Tim Geithner leave Goldman Sachs and, you know, multi-million dollar pay package, why would he leave that and go to a $170,000 a year position in, in the federal government? Why would he do that? Because they are sent into the government with the knowledge and understanding that they will be heavily compensated after X number of years when they come out of the government and after they have rooted all of this government money and largesse into the coffers of the banks that they are essentially working for. I'm not a big time conspiracy theorist. You're not gonna hear me talking about Rothschilds and all that kind of crap because what I think all of that is, is deflecting personal responsibility. We're all responsible for this, don't get me wrong. However, it is an absolute metaphysical certitude that these banks are intentionally populating these government agencies and bureaucracies with their own people in order to funnel the money back to them. That cannot be argued. I mean, that doesn't even fall into the domain of conspiracy because it's, there's not even anything secret about it. All you have to do is look at the list of people, okay? Now page 15, let's talk about repurchase agreements, repos. Another thing has a crazy complex name, repos, reverse repos. Oh my gosh, what's all this? It's actually very simple and you need to understand it because this is one of the most common financial transactions going on in the economy today and nobody has any idea about any of it. Okay, number one, MF Global. Let's put this in the simplified context of MF Global and John Corzine and in very simplistic terms, try to kind of rebuild what he did so that you can understand repos. MF Global buys Italian debt at a discount from Spain. Now, okay, we've got three, three entities here. We've got the private entity MF Global, we've got Italy, and we've got Spain. Now, wait, wait a minute, Spain is broke. Why does Spain have Italian debt? Oh, that's right, I forgot to tell you, because Europe is this massive cannibal situation where all of these countries are just broke, but they're buying each other's debt. And so it's all cross collateralized. It's an absolute disaster. But yes, this is exactly what's going on. MF Global buys Italian debt at a discount from Spain. Why? Because Spain needs the cash now to stop bank runs and keep welfare flowing. Okay? So Spain, Spain needs cash. Oh, we've got some Italian paper. Okay, or MF Global. Here you go. We're going to sell it to you. And we're going to sell it to you at a discount. Yes, Europe is a massive incestuous scam of broke nations buying each other's worthless junk bonds with money printed by the European Central Bank. That's exactly correct. That's the entire situation. Spain agrees up front, right up front, to buy back, repurchase, hence repurchase agreement. It's Italian bonds at full price from MF Global at a fixed date in the future. So let's look at it from MF Global's perspective. They are buying the Italian paper from Spain at a discount and immediately Spain says, I will commit to you via a forward contract to buy it back 
six months from now, a year from now, whatever the term is, to buy it back from you at full price. So MF Global has both legs of the transaction. They've got the actual buy now in real time at a discount, so buy low, right? They also have the forward sell contract at full price, so sell high. Buy low, sell high. They've got both of the legs locked in, okay? So what Spain is doing is called a repo, a repurchase agreement, because Spain is the one who's repurchasing. Reverse repo is not crazy difficult. All a reverse repo is, is it's, it's the other side. MF Global, what they're doing is a reverse repo. So don't think that reverse repo is some completely different extra complicated situation. No, it's just the other side of the coin. So Spain is doing a repo. MF Global has done a reverse repo because they're on the other side. What repurchase agreements are, and I have to credit Warren Pollock on this because this is his analogy and it's very, very good. Repos are basically like a parking garage, okay? So MF Global has rented a bunch of spaces in a parking garage and people bring their cars to this parking garage. They park their car in one of MF Global's slots and pay MF Global to park it there. MF Global gets to use the car while it's parked in the spot and agrees that yes, a year from today you can come back and I will have the car gassed up and washed and polished and completely maintained and ready to go and you can have it right back. But while your car is parked in my slot in the parking garage, I get to use it and you pay me. Okay? That is basically what repos are. Think I like that in terms of a parking garage. It makes a lot of sense. A parking garage for money. So now MF Global is holding the Italian bonds in, its, in one of its garage stalls. MF Global has given Spain cash equal to the value of the Italian bonds minus a discount. Okay, that was the buy low, minus the discount, and then there's the sell high that's already locked in on a forward contract. At the same moment, MF Global records on its books the agreed upon forward sale. So it books the forward sale immediately back to Spain. Thus, MF Global has the low buy and the higher sell on its books and, here's the punchline, recognizes it immediately as profit. Okay, but, so they've got the profit booked, but they get to hold it what's called off balance sheet. Have you heard that term, off balance sheet? That's what we're talking about here. Since the buy and the sell cancel each other out, GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, allows MF Global to carry this reverse repo off balance sheet, thus allowing for massive massive leverage. They can just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. Recognize the profit immediately, hold the actual transaction off balance sheet so so that according to GAAP it doesn't count again it doesn't count against your your firm equity. We're we seeing a problem? This is a disaster. What happens if the rent on the garage space goes up? Okay, they've got all these cars parked in these garage spaces. They're actually renting the garage space from somebody else. So this is a subleasing situation. What happens if all of a sudden the rent goes up? Well, MF Global must post a small amount of money for each garage stall it needs. If the rent rates suddenly double due to increased risk, meaning in real, in real world terms, Italian bond rates increase, it must immediately post the funds. But since they've been holding all this off balance sheet and they're levered up 20, 30, 40 times, if the rent goes up, it's going to wipe out all of their cash. And when I talk about the rent going up, what am I really talking about in real world terms? I'm talking about the interest rate on Italian bonds going up. That's what I'm talking about. MF Global would then have to post more collateral to secure that position. For those of you in the financial industry, it's margin. Okay, you can call it a margin call, you can call it a collateral call, it's basically the same thing. 
since MF Global has been legally permitted and encouraged to hold its reverse repos off balance sheet and is thus carrying, oh, let's call it 35 times more reverse repos than cash, the increased rent rate, the higher Italian bond rate, will wipe out the entire company and its customer asset base. That's what happened. Corzine put all of these repos on with European junk paper, and he's, a, he's psychotic. The man is a psychopath, okay? He, his brain does not work right. He does not have any sort of feelings of guilt or any triggers regarding honesty or safety or risk-taking with other people's money. So he just levered that company up through the roof. I think 35 times is probably being conservative in terms of the leverage of what he was doing. As soon as Europe got twitchy in the late summer and fall of 2011 and those Italian bond rates started inching up, he got a collateral call and he didn't have the cash to pay for it. And so what he did was he swept all of the customer money out of their accounts, out of their brokerage accounts, took that money and used it to pay his collateral call on his Italian reverse repo position. And he walks the streets a free man. And the latest word from the Wall Street Journal is that he's frustrated. That he's frustrated that he's not able to get back into the financial markets. And this is just, this is slowing down his career. He's frustrated. He should be tried. He should be arrested. He should be tried. And upon conviction, he should be executed sunrise the next morning. And I'm, I'm merciful when it comes to execution, so I'm a big fan of firing squad. If I, if I was going to be executed, I'd want to be executed by a firing squad. So, yeah, put the son of a bitch against a wall and shoot him with high-powered rifles until he's dead. Then he won't have to be frustrated anymore. But wait, it gets so much worse. MF Global, upon receiving the Italian bonds, what do they do? Now they're holding these Italian bonds, right? They turn around and they borrow money from the Federal Reserve at 0% using the Italian paper as collateral to fund what? More reverse repos. This is how you get spooled up to 35 times leverage or more. Take the collateral that you've received and then go borrow funds against that, posting the, posting the collateral as collateral. Okay, well, what? If, if any of us tried to do this, we'd go to prison for the rest of our lives. And yet, this is what the entire financial system is now pretty much built on. And don't forget, MFG, MF Global, also buys credit default swaps on Italian bonds from J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs for the term while they're holding the Italian paper. Sure, I mean, you've got a 6% spread. He had MF Global as a broker dealer, which meant that he could go to the discount window with the Federal Reserve and borrow at 0%. So he goes and borrows from the Fed at zero. Let's say the Italian rate is, uh, the Italian repo rate is, I don't know, 4%. He pays 100 basis points in CDS. I'm just making these numbers up. He still is making you know, three, four percent, when he can borrow money at the discount, at the discount window at zero. You see this? It's, it's just, it's sick. It's sick that this is happening. Why are they doing this? These are all fairly new developments, these repos and these CDS and so forth. These are fairly new developments. Exotic, risky schemes like these are a recent innovation encouraged by the government. How? Zero interest rate policy. I started my little teeny tiny commodity brokerage in 2006. At that time, the paradigm for all companies, all of these brokerage houses was, was that the customer funds were invested in nothing any more risky than 90-day T-bills. 90-day T-bills, that was as risky as you could get. And when I started, the 90-day T-bill rate was roughly around 5%. And so 
you know, the, the brokerage firm was splitting that usually with the broker. I declined that and I asked the 50% to go to my clients. I asked, would you please pay my clients interest on that? So my clients were actually getting about 2.5% interest on their free cash balances with me. I was one of the only commodity brokers in the entire nation who paid as a matter of course interest on customer balances. Because, believe it or not, interesting thing that I learned, I didn't realize this before I started, brokerage companies weren't making the bulk of their profit off of commissions. They weren't making their money off of commissions. They were making a lot of their money off of interest income off of the customer segregated funds which they were only investing in U.S. Treasury paper, which was at the time as close to perfectly safe and zero risk as you could get. So that was fine. That paradigm worked. As soon as you have the government put in place ZERP, zero interest rate policies, all these brokerage houses now and all of these other entities that we'll get into have lost their main source of income. It's gone. And so why did they start doing all these repos and all this stuff? Because they, they were desperately looking for a way to replace the lost interest income from ZERP. Okay? So the government has made this bed. Let's, on page 17, we're going to go through 90-day, a short history of 90-day T-bill rates in the United States. Fill in this little uh, matrix on page 17. First box on the left, January 2007. On the right, right in the box, that 90-day uh, T-bill rates were 5.11%. January of 07, 90-day T-bill rates were 5.11%. July of 07, they were 4.96%. January of 08, 2.82%. July of 2008, 1.66%. January of 2009, here's Obama, 0.13%. January of 2010, 0.06%. It's basically zero. January of 2011, 0.15%. Oops. And January of 2012, 0.03%. January of 2012, 0.03%. Wow. It was done completely intentionally, and it will destroy us. This cannot go on. Now, who is doing this? Who is doing these credit default swaps? And more importantly, who's doing all of these repos and reverse repos? The answer is terrifying. It's basically everyone. Banks are doing this, obviously. Brokerage firms, obviously, as we just went through. Insurance companies. Pension funds, private and union. Remember, interest rates are at zero, people. These pension funds are doing these repos and reverse repos in order to generate interest income. Money market funds. Large corporations. And state and local governments. Repos and reverse repos are today one of the most common financial transactions executed in the world. And they didn't even exist a few years ago. But everybody is doing them now. Why? Because of ZERP. They have to replace the lost interest income. How much are they doing this? On page 18 now, banks as of June 30th, 2011, in your first top box, J.P. Morgan Chase, and note the date here, June 30th, 2011, total assets of J.P. Morgan Chase 
$1.8 trillion. That's basically customer deposits. Let's call, let's call that customer deposits, $1.8 trillion. Total derivatives exposure, $78 trillion on $1.8 trillion in customer assets. Repos, reverse repos, CDS, et cetera, et cetera. $78 trillion in exposure. And we know it's that because um, th you, we can also see a breakout of how much of the stuff is over the counter and how much of it is exchange traded. And the over the counter, meaning the repos and so forth, that's in the high 90% area. They're only doing a tiny, tiny fraction of their derivatives, meaning futures contracts and so forth. Only a tiny percentage of this 78 trillion is on the exchanges. Most of it is what's called over the counter. That's repos and reverse repos and CDS, okay? So if we divide this out, the leverage of JP Morgan Chase is 43 times, 43 times leverage. And remember what we started with at the very beginning. Do you remember what the total GDP of the United States is? What is it, 15 and a half trillion? And we converted that into man hours, and it was 775 billion man hours, and which was 387 million man years. That's 15 trillion. Just JP Morgan, just one bank, has derivatives exposure of 78 trillion dollars. If you want to be an overachiever there at home watching this on YouTube, convert $78 trillion the same way we did at the beginning into man hours and man years. It's one bank. Next, Citibank. Total assets, $1.2 trillion. Total derivatives exposure, $56 trillion. If you divide that out, they're running at 47 times leverage. That's city. Next up, Bank of America. Total assets, one and a half trillion. Total derivatives exposure, 53 trillion. Leverage, 35 times. Oh, Goldman Sachs. This one, this one will make you sob. Total assets of Goldman Sachs, 89 billion. That's customer deposits, okay? They're not, they're not a big customer bank in the same sense as Bank of America and, and uh, J.P. Morgan and Citi. But they are one of the biggest in terms of derivatives. $48 trillion in derivatives exposure on $89 billion in assets. That's 545 times leverage. And you say, no. How, how, is, that, how is that possible? How can that be? How can Goldman Sachs be running at 545 times leverage relative to its assets? And the answer is because Goldman Sachs and the United States government are, for all intents and purposes, the same fiscal entity. And if anybody has any explanation other than that, I would love to hear it. And again, I would just encourage you to look at the people who are populating the United States government, the bureaucracy, the Federal Reserve banks, and look at their CVs. Where did these people come from? They came from Goldman, okay? Again, I'm, I'm, I don't like the whole conspiracy theory uh, worldview, but some, sometimes it's real. <laughs> and when it is real, you have to be brave enough to face it. That's it. And finally, let's look at the top 25 U.S. banks. Top 25 banks in the U.S. together, 8.3 trillion in customer assets. Total derivatives exposure of the top 25 banks, 249 trillion dollars. 30 times leverage. The GDP of the United States is only 15 and a half trillion. The, GD, the GDP of the entire planet is between 65 and 70 trillion. 
top 25 banks just in the U.S. and just the top 25 banks, $249 trillion in derivatives exposure. And so some people out there watching might say, well, Anne, if the system collapses, it'll be a symmetrical collapse. There will be symmetry to it. I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you part of that argument. Even if you give this a 90% haircut, even if you assume that there's 90% symmetry in the collapse of these derivatives markets, you're still looking at $25 trillion. These amounts of money don't even exist. We're into the domain of things that aren't even real anymore. Globally, derivatives exposure is at minimum one and a half quadrillion dollars. I told you we'd be talking about quadrillions. Okay, what we've been talking about is just the United States. What about Europe? What about China? What about Japan? What about them? No, okay, now we're into the quadrillions. Where's your wealth? Uh, remember the list of people that we just went through? Banks, insurance companies, pension funds, on and on and on. This is where your money is, money market funds, state and local governments. This is where your money is sitting. You need to get out because when the system collapses, it will happen so fast, you won't have time to react. You've got to get out. When should you be exiting the system? The answer is now. Computer programs, high frequency trading, HFT, you'll see that, uh, that acronym, um, also call, called the algos, which is short for the algorithms. Just computers, completely independently, computer programs trading the markets. Guys, that's all that's left. Computer programs now account for 70% of all completed transactions in the equities and futures markets and 99.9% .9 of all quotes in the equities and futures markets. The people are gone. The smart people started leaving years ago. There's nobody left. You, so you look at the volume on the exchanges for stocks and futures and so forth, and you well, look at all this volume. You know, look at how many contracts they traded today and look how many shares they traded today. It's not real. It's computers trading with each other, in and out in milliseconds. There's no people in there anymore. This is incredibly dangerous. And this, uh, these statistics come from Nanex. It's just an analytical company that does great work parsing all of this high frequency trading data and information. Market liquidity is totally dependent upon the algorithms now. As you could see, I mean, 70% of all completed transactions and 99.9% .9 of all bids and asks are computer generated. Well, of course the markets are, are completely dependent upon them. These algos are programmed to stop trading in the event of a black swan market shock. If anything crazy happens, the computers are, are programmed to step back. What does that mean? That means if anything crazy happens and the algos stop generating bids and offers, since there are no people left in there, uh, it's, the markets are going to go no bid like that. And then good luck getting out of your positions. Oh, it's no problem. I'll call my broker and he'll just put the orders in. What if there's nobody on the other side? You want to sell your shares. There's no bid. There is no bid. What are you going to do? The computers are gone, and that's, that's who you've been trading with for the last several years. Now they're gone. There's no bid. That means your wealth is gone. Solution, open outcry execution. After the collapse, after the war, by all means, you're going to need to rebuild markets. Forward delivery, and, uh, forward delivery which, are, which are futures markets, and stock markets, it's, it's a great thing. They're a wonderful thing, but they have to be done right with a rule of law. They need to be done open outcry. No more computers. Okay? Open outcry worked until just a few years ago. Just a few years ago. I put my first electronic order in in 2006. 2006! just going on seven years ago. All of civilization worked just fine with open outcry markets and execution up until just a few years ago. And you're gonna make the argument that there's no possible way that we can go back. You have to go back. If you let these computers in, 
if you're not trading with humans, it is going to, it's going to destroy itself eventually. Okay, you've got to go back to open outcry, dealing with humans. If you, you say, well, we, we want to arbitrage these markets. That's fine. If you want to arbitrage the markets, that's fine. You buy a membership. You go down into the pit. You stand in the pit, and you arb the markets like a man. You don't arb the markets by having some dork write you some computer code to arb the markets for you. You want to arb, man up and do it yourself. Stand in the pit and do it honest. I'm fully in favor of that. God bless you. Do it. Efficiency is good. But we're not going to do this computer crap anymore. Electronic order routing to the pits only. Trades must be executed by a human being with another human being. There are some people who are saying, well, you can do the algos if you just put a time limit on them. I don't buy it because it's still, it's still beyond the capacities of human trading. It's still beyond the capacities of human beings, and they will consume themselves eventually. Unfunded liabilities, meaning entitlement debt, welfare, Social Security, Medicare, blah, 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 of the United States government stands today at $222 trillion on a 75-year horizon, meaning the expected average lifespan of a child born today. 222 trillion. This figure assumes a static cost curve in today's dollars and interest rates. Yeah, never mind the fact that health expenditures are increasing at about a 9% annualized rate. No, that's not even priced into any of this. And never mind the fact that we're in a zero interest rate environment. None of that's priced into any of this. This is assuming static prices and continued zero interest rates. The truth is that these costs are growing at an exponential rate, like 9% per year, and interest rates cannot stay at zero and will likely hyperinflate. So this number right here is actually extremely, extraordinarily, deceptively low. Critical mass has been reached. It can't be walked back. The system is going to collapse. You are, if you are a person who is planning on being in any way dependent on Social Security or Medicare, you're not going to get it. It's not going to be there. The system is going to collapse long before you ever get there. Someone like me, I just turned 36. Oh, there's, if, if assuming, assuming that I live to old age, there is no possible way that I would ever have any of that. There's no possible way. I don't think that the average 60-year-old today is going to get any of this. The system is going to implode. Even if you are wealthy enough to never need or use entitlements such as Social Security or Medicare, or could always afford to pay cash for any health care you might need, these issues still directly impact you because they are what has destroyed beyond repair the United States, its government, and its economy. So if you're a high net worth individual, you can't just say, oh, well, fiddle dee dee, this has nothing to do with me. Yes, it does have to do with you because this, these entitlement programs, that you, that you have spent your life looking upon as, oh, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice that the government is giving all of these poor people free things? It is what will destroy all of us, including you. Giving people free things in mathematically impossible paradigms is not charity. Anything that is contrary to reason and truth is a lie that is coming from the pit of hell. Which is why when I see archbishop after archbishop and cardinal after cardinal in the church running their mouths about the need for universal health care, my anger is off the charts. You imbeciles, you idiots, how dare you? you everybody deserve, everybody's entitled to the right of universal health care, huh? Really? Where does health care come from? It comes from doctors, and it comes from nurses. Are you honestly so stupid? Are you honestly so poorly educated, your excellency, that you actually believe that one human being has the right to the labors of another human being? Boy, I, I don't know. That sure sounds like slavery to me. Doesn't it sound like slavery to you? How's this going to work? 
How are you going to provide an infinite quantity to people? How does that work exactly, Excellency? I want to see the math on that. I want to see the logic and the reason behind that. Our Lord himself is logic and reason. Our Lord himself is truth. Our Lord himself is even mathematical truth. And while you, Archbishop and Cardinals of the Church, are spewing these lies that are contrary to the truth, that are contrary to mathematical truth and to logic and to reason, you are agents of Satan because Satan is the father of all lies. Archbishop, cardinals of the church, you gentlemen need to pull your heads out of your ass before you destroy all of Western civilization. Now, do it now. Stop trying to rebel against your father. Stop trying to rebel against your Marxist homosexual seminary, profess seminary professors from the early 1970s. Stop it. You're killing everybody. You are in league with Satan. Stop it. For the love of God. Literally. Solution. Catastrophic high deductible health insurance only. Low deductible non-catastrophic health insurance is what has destroyed the entire health care market. Why? Because non-catastrophic insurance eventually destroys any market it touches because price point feedback ceases to exist. If you have insurance, you don't ask what anything costs. You just, oh well, the insurance will pay for it. That's why health care costs are inflating at a 9% annualized rate because there is no price point feedback because of insurance, because of government largesse in the form of these entitlement programs. No, this has to stop. Giving people free crap only destroys civilizations in the long run. All reform plans being bandied about in terms of the federal government and debt and spending and all of this contain no spending cuts. They only contain a decrease in the rate of increase in spending, including the so-called Paul Ryan plan. Ooh, Paul Ryan, he's a Republican and he's going to be the vice president if, he, if these elections even happen at all. But oh boy, he's our boy. And the Ryan plan, do you know what the Ryan plan is? Here's the rate of government increase in spending right now. Paul Ryan's plan does this. Paul Ryan's plan does this. It reduces the slope of increase, but it's still an increase in government spending. When that fork tongue liar, Paul Ryan, stands up and starts talking to you about all of these spending cuts, for the love of God, he's lying to you. That is not cutting spending. That is reducing the rate of the slope of the increase. My God. Additionally, additionally, do you know Paul Ryan's plan? He assumes a 5% annual GDP growth for 30 straight years with no recessions. I would like all of you people in the room like right now to inhale deeply for the next three minutes without stopping. Ready? Go. Oh, wait, that's not possible, is it? Yeah, that's not possible. We have to inhale and then we have to exhale in a respiration cycle. Economies are exactly the same. Expansion, inhale. Contraction, exhale. What is the average equilibrium? We all human beings, in terms of our diaphragm and our lung capacity, spend our lives on average at equilibrium. Half of it's inhale, half of it's exhale. And I would also remind you, get in your workbook and flip back to Carl Denninger's chart with the, the GDP and the debt, where the debt was above the GDP growth for 30 solid years. Since Carter, we have not been able to grow the GDP in this country without growing the debt 
way more, way more. And it even got to the point where it was at seven to one ratio. And you honestly believe when that fork tongue jackal, Paul Ryan, starts talking about his plan that we are going to have a 5% annual GDP growth for 30 solid years while we are delevering? With, meaning the, the debt line would be underneath zero. We would be delevering with 30 solid years of 5% annual GDP growth. And we haven't managed to do that for one quarter, not once, since the Carter administration. With the advent of the internet, we haven't been able to do that. What do you think? You think Paul Ryan's just lying to you because he's looking to become a multi, multi, multi-millionaire? off of his political position, yeah, I think that's probably what it is. And he's trusting that all of you out there are so ignorant that you'll never figure any of this out. And they'll just keep telling you, we're doing the best we can. No, they aren't. They're consciously lying to you. There's not a single honest, informed politician anywhere in the U.S. government who acknowledges any of this. There is no hope in Washington, D.C. or the political class, none. And I have a series of pictures up here, and they're all people who go under the moniker of Republicans. I didn't even bother putting any Democrats on there. I mean, if you're so far gone that you think that Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid are actually honest actors in all this, I, I can't even talk to you. That's just irrational. At this point, I'm talking to the people who are falling for these charlatans right here. Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You honestly think that they're going to change anything if they're even permitted to get in by whoever's running the government now? There's absolutely no way. They're not talking about cutting anything. It's just all going to keep going and going and going. Sarah Palin. There, there's this cult of Sarah Palin. I, I loved her. I was excited about her when she first came out in 2008. Hey, man, that's pretty cool. Here's a lady with five kids and her, a Down syndrome baby, and she's done some pretty awesome things, it looks like, up there in Alaska. Okay, sister, you've been given a massive bully platform, a massive bully pulpit. You, you tweet or go on Facebook or whatever it is that you do, and millions of people are hanging on your every word. And what have you done, lady? What have you done? Set, set your family members up with reality shows, and what it, you just got done writing a book on weight loss? What the hell? What the hell? Do you think that she honestly has solutions to any of the stuff that I've just covered? She may not even know about it. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. She may, she may not. At this point, I wish that she, she probably doesn't because ignorance is less of a sin than knowing about it and not saying anything about it. Ron Paul. <sighs> Again, have you actually heard him talk about any of the things that I've just discussed? He's throwing these little token memes at people like, oh, let's get back on the gold standard, trying to get people to throw money at him, making millions and millions and millions of dollars off of being in the government. Oh, and by the way, he's also an anti-Semite who is an apologist for Islam. Sorry, you're disqualified, you batshit old man. Michelle Bachman. Hey, let's talk about Michelle Bachman. Hey, she's awesome. No, she's not. That woman just raised $20 million for a presidential campaign that it was completely illegal for her to be running in in the first place. Michelle Bachman, up until just not too long ago, just a few months ago, was a dual citizen of Switzerland. You cannot be the President of the United States. You cannot be the Commander in Chief if you have ever been a citizen of another country. She was running for President and raised $20 million as a citizen of Switzerland the whole time. There's no hope, ladies and gentlemen, in any of these people. They are psychopaths. Alan West, where the hell are you, soldier? Where the hell are you? I met you. I met you in Leavenworth, Kansas at the Leavenworth 10 rally. 
and I talked you up and said, all right, this is the kind of guy. We need Alan West. This is who we need. This guy's going to go to Washington, D.C., and he's going to knock some skulls. And you know what? You know what Alan West did? He went to Washington, D.C., and he voted to let Obama raise the debt ceiling. He voted, um, let's see, he voted for the billion-dollar Pigford scam. He voted for the NDAA. He voted for the internet. What's the internet one? I can't remember the acronym for it. But basically giving all this surveillance power to the government to watch the internet. Um, and he also voted to approve Obama's completely illegal, unconstitutional military incursion into Libya with zero congressional approval whatsoever. And now we find out what was all of that. It was establishing a gun running scheme from the Obama regime to the Muslim Brotherhood and Al Qaeda. Alan West voted for that. Where the hell are you soldier? I'll tell you where he is. He's with all of the rest of them. He's looking at his bank account. He's looking at his bank account and he's thinking about how, how long is it going to take before he has a net worth in the eight figures. How is he going to parlay this? How is he going to parlay this into personal wealth? How is he going to parlay this into possibly a career on one of the, the so-called news channels? He's just like all of the rest of them. You people have got to snap out of this and wake up. There is no hope in Washington, D.C. It's over. Financial planning products assume an average 6 to 8% consistent annualized return. If you're invested in any of these products, not only will you not see that kind of return, if you do not move aggressively and proactively to remove your wealth from the financial system, you will likely have the vast majority of your wealth stolen, confiscated, or inflated away. You need to start moving right now. Because one second after the black swan event, it'll be too late. The government is going to attempt to inflate its debt away, confiscating your wealth in the process. This will accomplish nothing because all money is simply a proxy for man hours. That's why we started with this concept at the very, very beginning, almost two, hour, two and a half hours ago now. It doesn't matter how many zeros you put after a number. At the end of the day, all of these debts are man hours, human lives. You can't inflate debt away. It doesn't matter how many zeros you put after an hourly wage. The underlying debt must still be paid with the labor and productivity of men in an unchanging unit quantity. The objective for the foreseeable future is no longer to generate a return. The financial objective now is to hold your wealth together and minimize losses while the rest of the world burns around you and survive to the other side so that you can help rebuild. This is harsh and it is extremely unpleasant, but it's the truth. How do I generate a return? Well, I don't want to buy gold. Gold doesn't generate a return. That's not the objective. The objective is to hold your wealth together as much as you possibly can. This is Berlin. It's 1942. The bombers are flying overhead. Just because your building hasn't been hit yet doesn't mean it's never, ever going to be hit. This is going to get really, really ugly. You need to get out of Dodge now. Solutions. Don't bother moving. You cannot escape this. This is global. There's nowhere to run. Well, I'm going to go to Australia, and I'm going to go to New Zealand. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Really? Talk to Trevor Loudon about that. Have Trevor Loudon explain to you how China is positioning to annex Australia and New Zealand after the fall of the United States. Talk to him about that. I mean, you know, Decades ago, they'd love to have you, but today, there's nowhere to run. This is the United States. For all of its flaws, it, for all of its many flaws, this is the last bulwark of defense against the forces of evil running rampant all over this country. This is it. If the United States falls, it, all of humanity is going to go into a dark age. There's nowhere to run. This isn't like World War II where the, the people in Germany could come to the United States or come to Canada. Uh, there's nothing like that here. You have to stand and fight. 
And what part of that, a big part of that and those tactics is getting pre-positioned. You know that the battle is coming. You know that the war is upon us. Get yourself positioned. Allocate as much wealth as possible into physical commodities. This includes land, precious metals, livestock, firearms, ammunition, more firearms, more ammunition, more firearms, more ammunition, food, water, and fuel. Do it now. Because one second after, it'll be too late. You have to do it now. And so we'll, we'll end with the question, Quo Vadis? Where are you going? St. Peter, 35 or so years after the resurrection and ascension, was in Rome. And, you know, he'd been arrested many times and imprisoned many times and always managed to escape. And he escaped. He got out of Rome, and he was on the Appian Way, hightailing it south and east out of Rome. He'd gotten away. And as he's walking down the Appian Way, who does he meet walking back up the other way? He meets our Lord. And what does Peter say to our Lord, who he has not seen corporeally in probably 35 years? He's seen him every day in the Eucharist, but he, he hasn't seen him corporeal, corporeally in, in 35 years. And Peter says, Quo vadis, Domine, where are you going, Lord? And our Lord looked back at Peter, and he said, I'm going to Rome to be crucified again. And Peter nodded his head, and Peter turned around, and he walked back into Rome, and he was arrested, and he was crucified. It was his time. It was time. And he knew it was time because our Lord told him it was time. That's, that's what I'm doing. Quo vadis, Anne, where are you going? The answer is I'm going to Rome to be crucified. It's time. Some people have to. Not all of you have to do that, but some of us are called. Some of us have to stand and fight against this. And how can it not work out well? Because who's going with us? Who was crucified first, and who is going to be crucified with us? It's our Lord. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Like I said, the IRS has already started levying my bank accounts. They will levy all of my bank accounts. They will levy, levy my personal property. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. Quo vadis, where am I going? I'm going to Rome to be crucified. And you know? It worked out okay for Peter. I think they built a little old church over, over his grave, and uh, it worked out okay. But somebody has to do this. Some of you are going to have to do this. Some of you are going to have to stand. You have to stand and you have to fight the forces of evil, and now is that time. This is, this is as big of a war, this is as big of a battle as has ever been on this planet in terms, in human terms. You can't run away, you can't hide. Quo vadis, where are you going? I'm going to Rome to be crucified. God bless you, thank you all.